Brothers and sisters, I just want to welcome you and uh, I hope you are going to enjoy yourself as you listen to the message of God. Um, as you think what God is saying and to meditate upon the word of God, we encourage you that you also read the Bible as well when you are listening to this message so that you, you, you are not only listening to what we are saying, but you are getting it for yourself to say, this is what the Bible is saying. And I hope that will encourage you and to take you a bit far in your Christian journey. And if you are not a Christian and you are interested in knowing more about God, that would be a good start as well. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything that you do to us. We come before you because we know that you are God. You are the one who gives us everything we need in life. So when we come here, we've got the hope that has been given to us by you. We come as strangers, as friends, to worship you, Father. Sometimes we feel unwelcomed. Sometimes we feel distressed with other things. But we are here to be filled inspired and challenged by the word of God so that we know how close we are to God. Is It is always our goal. Father, be with us. Father, be with us, Lord Jesus Christ. As we are gathered here, Lord, others in their places, in their individual rooms, others in different places, and we know that you will accept us. Help us, Father, to accept one another with our differences. In the same spirit of love, generosity, for we are all equal before the cross of God. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love us. You love us. Show your love upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I would call my brother Ben to come and read from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. Let us listen to the word of God. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> and a lovely day here at Athena. No, it's a bit overcast, but every day is lovely in the Lord. As Johnson mentioned, bring your swords. And um, we'll read from James 2, 1 to 17. My brothers, as believers, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him who you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as you love yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favouritism, your sin and uh, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For who, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. 
because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one says to you, if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Wow, some stern teachings there from our Lord. And I um, can't wait to hear what Johnson's got to say. So, as he said, grab your Bibles, follow along. And even read it throughout the week. This is a really good scripture to grab a hold of. So, God bless. I'm back again. Um, as I was preparing this message, something struck me to say, okay, God is saying something here. Which means God is testing our faith by our attitude and action. So my theme today is God test our faith by our attitude and action. James is delivering a powerful message here. A person may profess to be a devout believer and may be able to quote many verses of scripture. But unless his words are accompanied by action, his faith is dead. What happens in the parking lot at Woolworths, IGA, wherever you are, at shopping malls, as we are driving after church, more accurately expresses the essence and validity of our faith than what happens in the worship service. Because in the worship service, we don't interact with the world. But our faith is tested, especially when we interact with the world as well. However, remember that the Epistle of James is an instruction manual for living, for right living. While James acknowledged that the Christian is the gift of eternal life through the death of Jesus Christ and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ, he does not want the church to forget external life as well, the way other people see us operating. A congregation should be taught sound doctrine but instructed in sacred duty as well. We are now supposed to say, someone is watching us. Someone is seeing us. Someone is observing what we are doing. Okay, someone asked the wise question. If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were being accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to, uh, to convict you? Do our lives prove we are followers of Christ? That is very important. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Matthew 7, verse 16 and 17. So the evidence of faith is not just pious devotion or faithful worship. The test of faith is how it translates into behavior. Do you pray for patience? Do you give generously to others? Do you treat the less fortunate with the same difference as you do the wealth? Do you seek to understand, not just to be understood? Do you stop yourself from responding rudely to others? Our children, our grandchildren, our friends, and our fellow workers are observing us taking note of how we live our lives. Everyone is observing us. Wherever you are going, how we respond to our circumstances. We can pray that our lives will be such that they are thinking, I want to be like him. I want to live like she does. Because someone is emulating what you are doing. If we are looking for peace, we must bring peace into our homes and workplaces. If we are looking for friends, we must be friendly to people we meet. 
to everyone. If we are looking for prosperity and well-being, we must help others achieve it as well. Our personal welfare is bound up with the welfare of those around us. You are not an island, you need others. How you treat others shows that you are either a follower of Christ or not a follower of Christ. In the early part of this passage from James, he was against showing preference to those who display signs of wealth. He says in James 2 verse 3 to 5, If you show special attention to the men wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor on my feet. If you do not discriminate among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts. And I've seen that happening. How can you claim to be a Christian and yet discriminate against people? It's so easy. It happens all the time. We are all bombarded with messages from advertising, from peers, and from friends that persuade us that the more we have, the better we are. The more important we are and the more privilege we deserve. Today, St. James tells us that we must never think that we are above or better than others. We are all sisters and brothers, members of the same Christian family. All people deserve respect, irregardless of their background. The Christian virtue of welcoming others allows us to welcome Christ. We have no option. This is a task. This task is, is part and parcel of our Christian vocation. We, we don't make choices here. We make our judgments about people based on their clothes, their color, their culture, their hair, their size. We show favoritism to those who seem to have more money, big houses, or more expensive cars. We strive to become like them, to climb the ladder of wealth and financial security. But in the end, after we have climbed to the top of the ladder, we may find it was against the wrong wall we have been climbing. So our spiritual maturity begins with the realization that we are all imperfect. No one is right, for we are all sinners. Hollywood teaches us to admire and reward beautiful faces and physiques. Scripture instructs us to beware of the pride and consider that accompanies riches or adoration of the body. Faith opens our eyes to see beauty in our differences. Much of prejudice is based on the inability to accept which is different from ourselves. Subconsciously, we are thinking, unless you have the same political or religious view, unless you are the same skin, color, Unless you are on the same socio-economic level, you will be unacceptable. This is said because there is so much we can learn from our differences. There is a broadening enrichment that can come to us when we tolerate or when we question to learn from those who see the world from a different perspective. We would learn a lot. We are fortunate that James, who was a brother to Jesus and was the leader of the Jerusalem church, wrote this. We need these warnings. We need these teachings because we are all influenced by our culture. We are prone to make judgments about people by looking at their appearances. And that is wrong. It is diametrically opposed to appropriate Christian behavior. It is really wrong. Even a case of reading of the New Testament demonstrated clearly that Jesus welcomed all people. No one was ever rejected or were given a chance. Jesus freely associated with those people whom society shunned against. He associated with lepers. Due not only to the contagious nature of their physical condition, but also their uncleanness according to the Hebrew law, were rejected by all, but not by Jesus. He welcomed them all. We can see how Jesus relate with the poor. St. Mark reports, a leper came to him begging him and kneeling him. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose. 
being made clean. And immediately the leprous left him, and he was made clean in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 42. In Luke's gospel, Jesus begins his ministry on the Sabbath in his hometown, synagogue. He reads from the prophet Isaiah these ways. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. When he finishes the reading, he says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So for Jesus, there is no way to separate his way, truth and life from the care of the poor. So much of Jesus' ministry was with his society's outcasts, the nobodies, the disabled, the destitute, the diseased, the mentally ill, and the poor. Those are his association. Jesus tells two stories about the last judgment. One is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man walked by the hungry, sick Lazarus every day and he did nothing. And the other in Matthew 25 is the king separating the sheep and the goats. The criteria used for judging one's life and one's fitness for eternal life with God is whether one has responded compassionately to the poor or they've not. So the poor matters to Jesus. He tells the rich young ruler, we had kept all the commandments to say all he had and give the proceeds to the poor. Then he had been ready to follow Jesus. Our abundance, others need and following Jesus are intertwined. They work together. So the poor matters to Jesus. They are God's children too. It is as though how we respond to the poor is evidence of our devotion to Christ. What we really believe and who really is, is revealed in how we treat the poor. How do we treat the poor in our society? Because Jesus gives us a new heart and that new heart removes our blindness so that we are able to see God as God. We see the Lazarus is at our doorstep and cannot walk by them as though they do not exist. Sometimes when we see those who are poor, we walk as even though they do not exist. Why do the poor present such challenge for those of us who know Jesus, our Lord and Savior? Why? I've got some reason why maybe these are challenges, poor tests and challenges. Is it because we believe the poor are poor due to their own choice? So they don't deserve our help. We owe them nothing. Is it because of that? Number two, could it be because poverty is so overwhelming, we feel there's nothing we can do that can make a difference? Jesus observed that the poor will always be with us. Therefore, doesn't it make sense to invest our time, energy, and resources on persons whose circumstance is not going to change anyhow? Should we continue helping the poor? Number three, could it be that we are challenged by the poor because they remind us that if we would be born in different circumstances or suffer different experiences, would be like them? I always think of myself to say, what about if I was born differently? Would I not be like the poor? Could it be that despite our claim to not to being able to relate to the poor, we have a sense that we share more in common than we want to admit? Number four, could it be that through the poor, God wants to give us holy gifts that can come any other way? So, we all recall the popular story in Luke 17, verse 11 to 19, of the ten lepers who came to Jesus and were cured, yet only one, a Samaritan, and not a Jew, returned to give thanks. Jesus also welcomed foreigners, even those who were despised by Hebrew society. He is welcoming the Samaritans who are of no identity. Recall how amazed were both the Samaritan woman and Jesus' disciples when he entered into a long and significant conversation with her at Jacob's well in John 4, verse 142. So Jesus took the time necessary to welcome the sick and infirm. St. Luke reports, as the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of diseases, brought them to him and he laid his hands on each of them and cured them. In Luke 4, verse 40. 
So Christ also reached out to those rejected by society. He called a tax collector, Matthew, to be a member of his inner circle of disciples. While scholars are not certain, tradition suggests that Jesus friend Mary Magdalene, the first person to see him after the resurrection, was a former prostitute. So, Jesus summarized his preferential outreach to the marginalized of Hebrew society. In Luke 9, verse 12 to 13, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn that this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. So the Lord put it this way, equating the unity of peoples to that of God, I ask that all may be one. His prayer was that all, 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 all Christians could be one. As your father are in me and I am in you, may they all be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent us. In John 17, verse 20 and 21. So the world will believe that God has sent us when we are one and when we do not despise one another. When we believe that we are one because of what Jesus has done to us. So St. James is in direct and challenging where he takes the message of Jesus and applies to his audience. The 12 tribes in the dispersion. Apparently, partiality and favoritism have been practiced for James immediately. equates such behavior with lack of belief in Jesus. James is saying, if you show favoritism, it shows that you don't have faith in Jesus Christ. Strong faith in Christ. Lack of belief in Christ. That's consistent with this basic message of an action-oriented Christian, Christianity. Namely, be, to be doers of the word and not mere listeners. So James attacks the problem through example. This illustration is one to which we can all can relate. Now as well as the apostolic period. Yes, this very thing is happening in our churches today. It's not happening somewhere. I read a story which says one person came in ragged clothing one Sunday and nobody welcomed him. Then the following week he came dressed in a very special suit and he was welcomed and given a chair to sit. So these things do happen in our life. We often make distinctions, creating separation divisions based mainly on what we observe or the previous opinions we have formed. We do this both with people we know and those we do not know. We make decisions and classify some people and groups as acceptable while rejecting others. James tells us, however, that Jesus preferentially chose the poor and those on the margins of society. He writes in James 2 verse 5, Listen, my brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor and the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Isn't that great? He says to distinguish between people, choosing some and rejecting others dishonors the poor, the very ones whom Jesus ministered in a preferential way. He goes on to say that Partiality is sinful. It's a sin and thus must be avoided. He summarizes his teaching by returning to his basic premises of the need to live an active Christian life. We must not only respect all but act on their behalf. Our actions toward the poor can truly make a difference. This morning, here, is communion Sunday. Christ Jesus invites us to this table where this is no distinction. Christ Jesus invites us to all you can eat a buffet of God's grace. And the only thing we are asking is to come empty so that you can live filled up. And today we can we can't come to this table if we come full. We have to come empty. You can't come full of yourself. You can't come full of your prejudice. You can't come full of hate. 
You can come full of anger at your brother or boss or spouse or children. You can come full of answers. You can come full of judgmentalism. You can come full. We have to come empty. You have to come empty so that you'll be filled when you leave this place. You have to come empty. You have to come hungry and needy. You have to come seeking, not satisfied. If you are full, there's no room for God's grace, love, and forgiveness. So you have to empty your heart and soul for, of all those things that might keep you from feasting at this all-you-can-eat buffet of grace and forgiveness. You know, at conversion, when people come to Christ, the thieves, the burglars, the drug addicts, alcoholics, you name it, they only side by side at the same communion rail. We all come to the same table. The prime minister, if he or she is a Christian, and someone, a nobody, they will sit next to each other when they come for Holy Communion, telling us something. There is something here we are being told through the scriptures. We are all equal before the cross of Christ. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? That's an abnormal way of looking at life, but this is the way Jesus, it is Jesus' way. But think of this way, it's not, for, it's not normal for the Son of God to give his life for our sins. It's not normal, it's abnormal. Thank God Jesus was abnormal. If he was, he wouldn't have a, 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 a chance. I leave you with this challenge today. Do something great with your faith this week. Do something. You can begin by engaging each person with whom you meet as though that person were a millionaire. That, the post person who delivers your letters, your parcels, the postman, the grocery clerk, the parking lot attendant, the waiter at the restaurant, the insolent teenager with the spiked hair. We are all equal. Treat them equally. Practice your tolerance muscles when you engage in conversation with those whose values and opinions are different from yours. Exercise patience. Listen attentively and compassionately. Recognize that our spiritual maturity begins with the realization that we are all imperfect in the eyes of God. Yet in his mercy he accepts us and loves us and sacrifices everything for us. Isn't that great news? It's really great to hear that with our imperfection we are also welcomed. But the problem is that as Christians when we get into the church for more years we get used to it and we think we are no longer sinners and we treat others with favoritism. The day will come, the day of judgment, when you will be asking, when did we see you hungry and we did not feed you? When did we see you naked and did we not clothe you? That day is coming. That day is coming. And Jesus said, if you didn't do to any of these little ones of mine, you didn't do it to me. May the good Lord bless you as you think upon these words. Are you one of the people who show favoritism wherever you are? It could be in church. It could be in meetings. It could be when you are meeting at conferences, wherever, in your own home. Do you treat people equally and the same? God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we confess that we are biased. We are biased against those who are different from us. Maybe we are wealthy and look down on the poor. Maybe we are clever and look down on those who are not. Perhaps with a big car and despise those who do not. 
Perhaps we dress well and despise those who do not. Forgive us, Lord. For such meaningless of spirit, it is not the spirit in which you welcome us. Thank you for your generosity to us. And help us to show the same acceptance to others. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for us to take our offerings. I encourage you, wherever you are, to take your time. You are already, by listening to this service, you are already worshipping. You are already in the service with God. So take time to thank God and say thank you, Father, for what you have done. So take time after listening to this message and give your offerings. Make your offerings to God. Let us pray. Father, bless these offerings which your children are now giving. May you continue to bless them as they exercise their generosity in excelling in the gift of giving. Bless them, Father. Bless every one of them who is participating in this ministry of giving. Be with us, Lord, and bless these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything that you have done to us. As we live hearing the message right now, Lord, go with us. You are our refuge. You are our fortress. Our God in whom we trust. We shall not fear. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.